I have to say, everybody, uh, welcome to uh, Sunday Live Shot. Super special guest today. My old pal, missed you so much, buddy. Justin K. Broderick is joining me. Hello, Justin. Hello, Kevin. It's How are been you doing today? This is uh, an immense, yeah. immense pleasure to, uh, to have you here um, with us today. Um, let's Sorry. look at the connection here. Everyone looks to be all happy. Oh, good. Hi, everybody. Well, I don't know if we were on for that brief second or not, but anyways, Justin K. Broderick joining us today. Are you currently in Wales? Yeah, um, North Wales. Very, very, it's funny, a lot of people when they sit there like, oh, you're in Wales, but all there is in Wales is North, South, there's the West Coast, and in the middle is literally just barren. Very little there. Um, tiny ass little villages but north wales is quite built up and south wales is more built up but here is really um it's a joke because people just say just that over uh, being overtaken by the english which it is it's mostly full of people like me brummies manx people from liverpool scousers as we uh fondly refer to them in the and um yeah so we, we've uh we've we've, we've taken over North Wales. <laughs> Way to go. So is there a creative community there or is it, is it, is it more, do you like the isolation or what is it? Inspiration? Yeah, it's, yeah. It's the isolation. There's absolutely zero, nothing, nothing whatsoever. I mean, the nearest cities, you know, we've got, you know, Manchester's like what, 60 miles from where we are. Uh, oh, Liverpool, yeah. pretty much the same. So you've got like, you know, you know, great English cities nearby. Um, but we chose up here because you can get bigger properties for less money uh, relative to like big cities inland. Um, and um, the more than anything, for me, the isolation, yeah. Well, I mean, we're on the outskirts of a, a tiny village where there's no, there's no shops, um, there's like one pub, uh, and we're right on the outskirts of that. So, and we can see the sea from our house and... You know, and it's it's um, it's quite it's quite idyllic in that regard. It's it's also it's pretty barren. It's uh, it's not a particularly it's not attractive countryside in some some regards. It's pretty. Uh, but I, I, I mean, I love the isolation. You know, my partner isn't so bothered about that, and my son, well, all he knows is this: we were brought up here. You know, so he doesn't know the the Birmingham I come from, or he doesn't know these you know cities or anything. Um, but yeah, for me, it's like I can, you know, exist here without seeing a, another human being for days, you know, and that that is pleasurable. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's uh, I guess I mean it's it's a lot different than than being in Birmingham, where is that is that your original stomping grounds, right? Yeah, that's it. I mean, um, when we first toured together in '92, uh, we were still living in Birmingham. You know, I was still living in like a shared house. Um, you know, we still hadn't quite even, uh, you know, managed to earn enough money by that time to even live outside of uh, rented accommodation and, you know, and still existing partly on benefits up until, I think up until we toured actually with yourself in 92 and the Pure album came out at that, at that period was when we actually managed to be able to, you know, start getting a little bit of a living, you know. Um, and then that sort of, as we all know, that those early 90s were pretty... Uh, pretty exciting times for, you know, this music getting noticed and being often misinterpreted and all the rest of it. But um, it was a, a, a time where money got thrown at, at this stuff, wasn't it? So, and there was a, like quite an audience for it and stuff. Um, so it was a pretty, yeah, I mean, it was a really, uh, really busy time. And we eventually got out of rented accommodation and stuff and it was fantastic. So, um, but, but yeah, so I left Birmingham when I was 24, when we toured together, it's like we were saying previously, I was, I was 22 years old, you know. And now uh, I'm 30, and now I'm 61. <laughs> I know, I was, it was a sobering reminder. Obviously, you know, we've seen each other on, you know, on, on the barest occasions, and we've, we've been at the same shows, and we still haven't managed to be, but we've met here and there. But we've never, I've never really come to terms with the fact that, like I said to you recently, I, I was stunned that you were 30 when we were touring together. I just made this assumption that everyone was probably around 26, 27, you they know, were. you. Yeah, they were, I'm the oldest. So uh, Dwayne was uh, 26, was was 27, yeah. So we were, you know, pretty young. Oh, okay, you yeah. Funny? 
want to see what I found today? And you know, what's really funny is that I just found this, and uh, it's oh, okay. it's like I didn't know if I had if if I had any pictures from the era. Oh, let's see if I can get this to play. Oh man, look at that though. How embarrassing! That, it's David Lee. It's David Lee Kevin. But who's it's awesome. That? Look at oh, that. Oh Jesus! I've still got some of those videos, but they've got mold on them. So you're, but, you're um, yeah, you're videoing us here with yeah. Ben, good old Ben. 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 <laughs> this is at the Palladium in LA in 1992. It's the last date of our tour, and Dwayne is actually filming you here. Oh my God! Yeah, and. Uh, wow. It's you know it's kind of like, I was thinking do I actually have any photographs of it's us amazing. together on the tour but there you go oh it's Dwayne as well you know that somehow that is coming back to me this this moment which is pretty crazy and uh, this oh that was the guy who was working for us um Bill I think his name was Bill Schipp or you I was gonna say Sean I've got no idea but he was a lovely <laughs> guy <laughs> but uh yeah oh my this footage is awesome. And this we show. had to, but you, you see me filming then. Ben and I shared that uh, our manager, uh, the only manager we really truly had, Kristen at the time, she like loaned us that camera or something, or we got it loaned off someone. And I filmed so much of the tour, I'm like high eight. Yeah, look at this shit. This is exactly how I remember you guys as well. But <laughs> it's the only way I remember you anyway. To me, you always will be those guys. <laughs> I've never seen you. You don't age. You've just been. You've just been those guys. Oh, it's amazing. Some pretty. Cl you know that gig turned out to be. I'm going to say like possibly one of the the the, the, the classic greats. You know the. Um, uh, oh, it was Hollywood Palladium for fuck's sake. Yeah. I, I can't remember a, a gig where it was like the mo uh, more. You know that that gig was pretty special. I thought. Yeah, I remember. I you know what's really odd is I really didn't recall that it was the last show on the tour. Yeah. That's incredible. I, I, for some reason, I've actually got barely any active memory of what the last show was. Um, I felt like that show was obviously the routine. <laughs> it wouldn't have been, that would have been the last show. You know, it makes complete sense. But in, in thinking about it, it's like, <sighs> this just makes no sense to me at all. That, that was actually the last show. Incre I mean, I remember that quite vividly. I think Ben and I have discussed. And the fact that we played Hollywood Palladium you know, first and last time. I don't think we ever ever stepped foot in the building again. I think when we supported Danzig in LA, I, I can't remember where that was. I know we played even outskirts of LA, but it wasn't the Palladium. That was quite magnificent. I think, though. you know, that was for sure probably the biggest gig that uh, we did in LA, a skinny puppy as well. And I remember wow. we came backstage and like Terry Bozio was back there and he was like, oh, I, he was like, fuck yeah. man, you ripped it. And I'm like, you're telling me I fucking ripped it. And then it was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like all these people. Yeah, that was, it was one of the, I remember it was one of those sort of nights where it was like. One of those nights. Yeah, celeb city as well. Like lots of celebrities. And I remember yeah. we, we were blown away, you know, it was like, we'd just been thrown into. Well, you, uh, guys, you guys were killing it. I mean, we, so let's tell the story. Originally, you guys had some trouble getting into the country. And so we were like, pieces every time. Yeah. We had to get um, some other bands to fill in. And then finally in Texas, you guys rolled in. And it was like, I remember it was like sweltering. It was like about 120 degrees. We and never felt it. And it was like, God flesh your hair. And I'm like, no fucking way. Yeah. And we did this gig in this place that had no AC. And it was our first thing. I, I thought I was going to die that night. That's but right. I think, yeah, I collapsed, I think. It I think I may have been. San Antonio, I think. Yeah, San Antonio. That, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't this one, City Limits at, at, in Austin. Oh, that's shit. Austin. oh, no, that's Pittsburgh. Um, let's see what we got here. Oh, we did the Ritz. Did we? Yeah. Was that maybe the one we didn't go to. Whoa, that was on stage with you guys. Yeah. That looks like we're playing the usual shed. This, is, this is a Texas <laughs> show. That's a Texas show for sure. I, I can guarantee you that. That may be the first one. Oops. And when I met you guys, this is this is how young you looked. Oh my God. Look at that. That's, that's 1988. That is. I, I was like 18. I think I think Ben was like 23. That's perfect. It's ridiculous. You guys had made Street Cleaner already at what? Eight in 88 or 89? And like 89, you know, yeah. I was 19. Like, you're yeah. what? Are you 20 years old in 1989? You've already made like a seminal album. 
Yeah, I mean, people used to say that, with, with, you know, making Scum as well, you know, the Napalm Death album. Literally, you know, that was like 1986 when we made that, the, the, the side A of it, that was. Oh, look at this as well. This is the Cameo Theater in Miami. I don't know if you guys made that one or not, but quite you know legendary what? shows, what? man. Look I at can't that. remember that. Cute, yeah, cute that's the... out there. Oh, who's that? Whoa, Jeez. look at that. Look at Ogre, man. You, this is what you were used to seeing and touring with every night. But this is what we got to see before we went on. Fucking totally inspired. Look at that. So you, that was by um, this time. You guys was, had made the Pure album, right? And you were, were you touring the Pure album by this point. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. We were we were touring Pure basically. Look at that. That was some crazy lads. Yeah, that is exactly how I remember you as well. If you if you weren't topless, <laughs> you were wearing. <laughs> I think you were wearing that David baseball Lee, jersey. Kevin in that one. <laughs> yeah. No, I remember that. The, I think the what had the Pure album come out yet, or was it? Is it just 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 about? You know what? That I, I cannot yeah. actually recall. First Avenue shit. Um, First Avenue, Prince Club. Yeah, I remember playing after that too. I think we came back, we did a headline show there, clearly not in the same, in, in like the toilets or something. <laughs> <laughs> if we were lucky, a cubicle in the male toilets. <laughs> but yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I was shit, studying yeah. a bit of your. Um, your history, I mean, I, I just find it amazing that, um, you know, the story about being raised with your parents in one of the most controversial punk bands, uh, it's kind of like in British history. Like, I mean- Yeah, somehow, like, like, like the, the most controversial, like, like the most controversial punk band nobody had ever heard of, apart from John Peel, which was quite, <laughs> for, quite fortunate for the legacy of the band, really. But yeah, yeah, I mean- It's yeah. a damn rare album or a damn rare single. And that, Jesus, social. that must have been some like, oh, that's the band. Yeah, that's that, That's a put to, I'm uh, in that, I've been, I've been taken out of that photo. There's me as a nine year old uh, next to, in between my mom and the guy with the drink, John Harrison, who was the drummer and also my mom's first husband, actually. Um, yeah, that's so, my st stepdad in the bottom left hand corner who was, the singer and guitarist for uh, the Antisocial. Anti Prior to that, they had a band called Maniac, where Rob again, the guy in the bottom left corner, who, who was my stepdad, because my dad was gone by the age of like me being one, um, due to heroin addiction, uh, as you do, as you did in the early seventies, uh, <laughs> as you did in the nineties. <laughs> sure. But um, yeah, um, but and this guy, he replaced. No, my mom replaced the guy on the far right. My mum, I think, uh, learned to play bass in two weeks. And oh, there she is in the middle of it. Uh, yeah, they, they, they did that stuff. Yeah. That, that's, that, that, I mean, of course, not. I bet that didn't happen, though, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the crazy thing with that was um, the police turned up at, my, at the house, the flat we shared, which was above a fucking shops in a council estate in Birmingham, where I, I was raised between the ages of, like, five and... Uh, like 13, um, horrible flat. We had, there was no garden. It was a car park, <laughs> a gravel <laughs> car park. Um, truly bleak industrial fucking environment. Like really, really, really inspiring, obviously. Um, <laughs> but the police turned up after that advert, uh, you know, the usual police, you know, 5 a.m. or some shit, banging the door down. Uh, and I was like nine or something. Um, and all I remember was, being woken up and three police officers entering my bedroom with a woman up front saying, it's all right, we're just the gas people, love. It's just the gas people, which obviously I'm nine years old, but you know, as you start coming to, you're thinking, the gas people at 5 a.m., it's pitch black outside, followed by my mum, where she was like, you gotta get out of bed, Justin. Got out of bed and she took me to, my, my nan and granddad live locally. And as she was taking me up the road and we were, we were being chaperoned by the police, she was dropping me off. They were going to the police station to obviously be in, interrogated about their, uh, you know, the performance with a, a suicide bid. Uh, and it was on the front of like the local Birmingham newspaper, the Evening Mail or some shit like that. And it was almost, you know, it was a bit of a thing for a minute. Um, but yeah, it was taken 
somewhat seriously by uh, the police forces of Birmingham for, 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 for a moment. I can only imagine, though. I mean, <laughs> my imagine. childhood was full of these, uh, you know, but it was just one big party for my parents, for my mum and my stepdad, like, you know. <laughs> What an inspiration, though, because I guess you don't realize that you're growing up within a musical environment and you're soaking up all this musical inspiration. And um, I'm gathering that, um, that, you know, the albums that you heard, like, made an impression. I heard that you you had heard metal machine music and um, yeah, at a young age. And, and I'm telling you, this album can that, make... That sleeve as well. That sleeve alone is inspiring. <laughs> it's, it can make an impression at a young age. I can only imagine that you're... You're hearing this before the age of what, ten years old? Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, because nobody played it. Obviously, <laughs> like you know, my parents, my my mum and my stepdad. You know, they were well. My dad and my stepdad, so he was obsessed with Lou Reed. But like that album, I remember them. It's just fucking incredible, sleeve as well. The liner note, that you know, the liner notes. Everything. It's incredible. It's, it, everything it represents too is that it's an anti-album. Exactly. Yeah, it's, yeah, absolutely. It, it, you know, even, it, you know, or even if it was like an excuse to get out of a contract, it's one of the best excuses ever to get out of a fucking contract. It plays out better than an anti-album. That's the thing. It plays absolutely. out like, wow, this is, this is brilliant. I, I, I knew when I first heard it as a kid that, I, you know, I had a connection with, quite clearly, a connection with textual noise, you know. And that I because I, because my, my my stepdad was more into playing street hustle or something. Do you know what I mean? He was he wasn't even a VU fan really. I came to Velvet Underground via people like Ben Godflesh and other friends of his that were mine as well, like Paul Neville who was in Godflesh, uh, Dermot who was in Yazer with me and stuff. Um, I came to VU via their my, my stepdad was strictly into Lou Reed albums, you know, and followed them religiously, you know, just as he did like Alice Cooper and. Uh, you know, a lot of classic, iconic, you know, 70s uh, artists, you know. Um, but I remember when he brought that home and I heard, I was listening to their conversations about it because my mom and stepdad used no filters around me. There was no filter about any, you know, I was exposed to shit you should not be exposed to. <laughs> Simple as, you know what I mean? Um, for good or for worse, probably for worse, but I've got a career, a career out of it. Oh, man, look where you are now, though. <laughs> it's, 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 <laughs> Thanks to them in, in yeah. both negative and positive contexts. But yeah, but um, I remember them speaking. It was almost like this mythical record, you know, like this is some album. It's just noise. <laughs> you know? And I remember them putting it on and being struck by, I could hear something, you know, there was like some, sort, and there is, when you, obviously, as you know yourself, I'm assuming you're, a, we've never spoke about that album, but I'm assuming you're a fan of that album. Yeah. Um, there's a harmonic thing, isn't there? It's classic. It's like like when he references Lamont Young or something as being, you know, we 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 had no context, you know. My my stepdad was was a learned musician, an artist, but he was still a council estate, poor, living on the doll musician, you know. He hadn't had the benefit of um any formal education in that regard. He did go to art college for a bit, but he, you know, he hadn't he hadn't been through, he wasn't middle class, he hadn't gone through an education system and been taught about people like Lamont Young or, you know, and so on. So they came to it via, just purely via discovery of music. And my, my stepdad obviously had that first, as did I, for being in, entirely inquisitive about the roots of music, you know, and the trajectories that things take and following that trajectory. Um, so really, you know, because they, they, simultaneously around that same period, another guy who was in the antisocial band, my mum's first husband, John Harrison, before my dad, before Rob, the, who was my stepdad, who was in the photos as well. Um, I heard Brian Eno. He brought round uh, uh, Music for Airports. This is around a similar sort of period because Music for Airports is um, 78, isn't it? I think. I think it's 1978. Um, so I was exposed to that as one. Well. It was immediately captured by, again, I mean, we're talking, I'm eight, nine years old, you know. Yeah, that's um, good. So, I'd, you know, I'd, being exposed to that stuff without any particular context apart from the metal machine music obviously it's like nobody can listen to it and nobody's going to listen to this but like i was saying when they put it on and what i hear now is a, a, a real sense of harmony amongst this embedded amongst this noise but i clearly love noise <laughs> and i've always loved noise <laughs> so throbbing gristle and and white house came along as at 10 and you're you're able to per perceive what's going on probably from your 
early life training. This is it. Yeah, this this is it really. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, around, t- I mean, my door from that, you know, my door to extreme electronics was crass. Um, Amazing. Really, and it was crass being like, um, you know, there was a fanzine crass, um, it was their collective sort of put it together, but there was a lot of other people involved outside of crass book called Toxic Graffiti. I remember buying that and reading about Throbbing Gristle in it. There was a, it wasn't a Throbbing Gristle interview, it was more a set of statements. Um, and the imagery, um, it just hit me immediately, you know, it was very familiar to me as well. So I was absolutely inquisitive as to how this sounded. Um, and as soon as I managed to hear Throbbing Gristle, which I think was in a it was in a place where I met Nick Bullen from Napalm Death. I met Andy Swan, who became a part of my original Noise Project final when in 1983. Uh, so I was a little bit older, actually. I think I was more like about 11 or 12 when I discovered TG, because I went to see, I think I saw Crass live first when I was 12 or 13. It's amazing. They let kids in to shows to see Crass? Yeah, in Birmingham. Yeah, yeah. If you had a ticket, you were yeah. going in, you know. You just had a ticket. It did. They made no fucking difference. Nobody gave a flying Amazing. fuck, you know. It was just I remember, yeah. yeah. Crass was brilliant in the sense that they were really intimidating and they had really great philosophy and really great sense of direction and everything. Really intimidating. And so I could see yeah. coming from them as a kid and they say, oh, I've got to find out about TG or White House, kind of like on the same page. And yeah, then, uh, yeah, this is, this is it. Yeah. 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 It was uh, often, you know, ex- extreme electronics to me seemed like an extension. Of the of the crass movement, so to speak, you know, because a lot of crass bands affiliated with crass use noise anyway. I mean, it was like like you know, when I first heard uh, stations of the crass cross, um, you know, in I was about nineteen eighty maybe or seventy nine. I was ten or eleven. Uh, well, it's feeding on the five thousand. I first heard it was the, a new drummer in my mum and stepdad's band antisocial i think they changed the name by that time they had a new young drummer they're trying to get young blood in the band because they were like in the 30s then now um he had feeling the 5000 i think i was at his flat or something and i was often left in rooms just to do what i wanted you know drawing book since we didn't have devices have a drawing pad somebody's record collection you know i remember pulling out feeling the 5000 being absolutely like the sleeve just immediately caught me the lyrics you know it caught me even at that age and putting it on there was just something so alien again about the sound that I just, because most people in retrospect now, if they hear, if they, you know, younger generations hear crass, I can see they don't quite get it. You know, musically it's, it, you, you know, you, you could be forgiven for saying it's of its time. To me, obviously it just captures a magic, a magic moment, but so many bands affiliated explored noise and feedback and, you know, seem to have these multi-layered, uh, yeah, it's a truly inspirational. I mean, I was always drawn to it. It's funny because, again, you know, another one, my stepdad, Rob, was also obsessed with Jimi Hendrix. So, again, feedback to me was quite a natural thing, you know, guitar feedback. And, you know, my stepdad also was, you know, obsessed with Jimi Hendrix to the point of emulating him. He was a fantastic guitarist, my stepdad. He was the sort of guy who would just sit there on his, like, Fender Strap copy because he couldn't afford the real Fender Strap and um, just guitar solo all day. You know, these sort of guys. And I was never in, you know, I'd always think like, amazing. I'd just sit in his company and watch him sitting there, you know, Jimi Hendrix solos and stuff like that. But I was too enamored by punk rock, you know, I just wanted to learn a, a bar chord and thrash. Cause you know, when I did a discharge, I was just like, you know, 1980 or I think 81, 80, 80 was it Realities of War, first single. So. But I was like, I just want to play like that. And I know it's simple, it's punk rock. Just show me that one chord and I'm off, you know, I, I've got it. I think that's all I, that's all he ever taught me. And that's all I ever knew. You know what I mean? I, think yeah, yeah. I, I learned, I learned E, A, G, C, D, and uh, maybe F sharp. And that was about it. I never, never learned anything formally again or educated in any regard whatsoever. I just completely took that attitude of punk completely to heart. But it was also about, um, I think it was natural because I was so young as well. It's quite clearly, uh, you know, I wasn't going to be, you know, quite clear to me. I wasn't going to be Frank Zappa. Um, nor did I wish to be, you know. It was like yeah. I, I need that. Uh, sure. I, I'm I'm going to be a punk rock musician. And that's all I need. I can I can throw three chords together and uh, I'm done. You know that that's that's it. And uh, I'm I'm still there now. <laughs> I mean, you're a multi instrumentalist. So 
it, it you know be, whether you're playing the drums or whether you're playing the guitar or what do how did you decide that you know which direction to go or did you just say fuck it i'm going to go in all directions i think that's it really there was something really um i think I've, i probably spoke to we probably spoke about this in the in 92 you know around those periods where there's, there's something so primal about drums there's such an immediate sense of expression with beating skin yes <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that, you know, that's true man that's yeah. why i chose to go on the road when i regularly you know program synths and do all this stuff like Dwayne. but live i just couldn't hold back from having to you know play drums and so it was like kind of like a primal thing but absolutely um, I, I it came later that. with with you didn't it so it was like you know, it wasn't like with Skinny Poppy, you were playing drums immediately. Like you weren't, you were pro, like a synth, a, you know, I never like, thought of you as a drummer, but then it was like, fucking hell. On that tour, it's like, you're a fucking killer drummer. This is awesome. But again, like yourself, you know, it's like, and I think for me, it was, I don't know whether I really, I was never that inspired by drummers. I was much more inspired by the, 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 the the catharsis. I mean, I was put into cheap drum lessons for a little while, you know. So those are, I went to prop like formal drum lessons, uh, you know, like being taught paradiddles, you know, and stuff like that. And I remember thinking, I was about 11, 12 years old, you know, I was just like, fuck this, you know what I mean? I was, I was like, I'm not here for this, this shit. I'm here, you know, I, I left these lessons real quick and just bashed out the rehearsal room. Yeah, yeah, there weren't they? I remember you know, some guys are showing you something like, fuck off, like, get out of here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like, it was the same I was with guitar. I think my yeah. stepdad was quite disappointed, you know, when he taught me one chord. I was like, that's fine, I'm done. But like, <laughs> you don't want to, you know, learn any guitar solos? Nah. I don't need it. No. Then, I remember one of the first things you ever said to me is, hey, uh, Napalm Death are really into Skinny Puppy. I thought like, Napalm Death, holy shit. Aren't yeah. you, you were in Napalm Death. Yeah. First yeah. Off, is this you with the long hair here? Jesus, so many people often, when I was younger, get me confused. Quite, I can see it sometimes with Bill Steyer. Are you it's, in this uh, picture? No. No. Yeah, I, mean, I was way gone before this, but uh, oh, Mick Harris on the on the. Yeah, you know, okay. The, this is where you you are then. I was trying to wonder if you had. Yeah, so, side A of that. that um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's very few photos of us because when the album blew up, I was already gone. You know, I'd already left the band. Um, you know, it blew up well after the after the event you know much, much to my surprise as well i'd already joined like a, a a fantastic band called head of david and i joined them on drums purely because i was playing in um you know as i i joined ben godflesh and uh paul neville who was on street cleaner and slave state uh uh well paul neville's at half of street cleaner and pretty much most of the slave state I mean. but um i joined their band for the because you know and I, I literally just, they had a really shitty, like, old boss drum machine. They got in some second hand <laughs> school. And uh, Ben, Ben was on bass and vocals, uh, loosely speaking. He was, like, a murmuring uh, thing. <laughs> uh, and Paul Neville's on guitar. And they they loosely sounded like the Cure circa uh, 17 seconds. Right, they had that right. sort of sound. But when they met me, I had all that punk rock and industrial music shit going on. So I introduced them to a lot of that side of things. They more introduced me to, uh, you know, sort of uh, proggy stuff. I wasn't really, you know, that wasn't wasn't my thing, you know. But right. um, and a whole lot more besides. Obviously, I mean, you know, they got me into later period the damned, whereas I only swore by machine gun etiquette, you know, and stuff like and so on, you know. But loads and loads of stuff anyway. But um, but yeah, when I when I joined, I, I was like, you know, I'm a drummer, which I was a complete lie. I was just a fucking piece of shit drummer. So, I always was. But somehow via bluff and uh, it, it, teenage confidence and passion, I talked my way into their band, you know, because I met them on the streets of the council estate that we come from. And we only connected over the fact that we all had odd haircuts, you know, because in the place we came from, it was just full of fucking, just full of football hooligans and, you know, working class or, uh, you know, those straight workers, you know, and fucking just a hard, pretty harsh environment. A lot less people like than there is now, a lot less cars and stuff, obviously. but um. But, you know, you connect with anyone. It was that sort of environment. You know, if you saw someone with a slightly spiky haircut, because, you know, you get spat out for having a spiky haircut, then you remember these days, do you know what I mean? You know, like 15 years later, every motherfucker had a fucking spiky haircut, do you know what I mean? Yeah, but I yeah. remember 
getting spat at on buses for, I remember getting spat at for having dreadlocks, you know, you know, in fucking, in, uh, in like 87 when I, when, uh, you know, 86 when I was in Napalm Death and then joined Edda David. But, you know, I, I, I just bluffed my way into that band, you know, but I had energy, songs, riffs, um, and they were just quite happy for me to take it over. You know? <laughs> when, when did you uh, say, okay, I'm making the shift from drums to guitar to say that this is like... It was all at the same time. I was consistently playing guitar and drums simultaneously, really. Okay, yeah. But because I still lived at home in a shitty flat, um, and you could <laughs> never have drums. You know, these were like, you know, rows of flats. Classic industrial looking fucking garbage shit. Uh, you couldn't have drums in them places. You know, someone would, someone would kill you. Um, so it was like, you know, you'd be lucky to get anywhere to get on a drum kit. So I had, uh, I, for a while, I used a combination of my mom and stepdad's stash tins. They had an old camel tin that they put their hash in and stuff. And that was a symbol. And I had their old couch as well. I managed to blag some drum kit, some drumsticks off someone. I literally taught myself to play drums. I remember the first time I sat at a kit. And I, I had a kick drum. I was just like, How do I, what do I do with that? I've been used to just bashing away along to Killing Joke records and Grass records, you know. Then I had to work, get the kick drum in, you know. I was like, holy shit, there's a kick drum. Um, then eventually, yeah, I mean, you know, X amount of time. So, you know, I was playing with Napalm Death on guitar. A lot of the same nights we play, you know, the Mermaid Pub in Birmingham. I play with Napalm Death. I get four because on the bill as well. And I play drums with them, and I was, sing, I was singing and uh, singing. I was shouting before because I'm playing drums. So that was the, that was that shit. And then later with Napalm Death guitar and backing vocals, or I sang one song. Um, so I was doing it all simultaneously, you know, basically. I kind of I kind of get the idea that this experience and being involved in this in these groups sort of like taught well made you realize quickly what you wanted to do, and it seemed pretty. Yeah. Clear that you know, you had a directive that you were kind of like, it's not every day that someone kind of invents a kind of genre of music that comes from this, that, and this and that, and combines this and then remains kind of consistent as like a reference point for years. You, Godflesh has become like, you know, a household name amongst many musicians who will say, you know, Godflesh, oh, Godflesh, you know, it's like a reference point and for a good reason. Yeah. You know, I think, now what do you think it was that, that like, made like all that collective energy say, okay, I mean, you met what Ben in uh, the fall of because. Yeah. And um, you decide what you, you decide to make, uh, uh, what, what was it that, that, that decided, you, you knew you needed to make something new at that point and, and, and along came, comes what street cleaner. Yeah. I mean, after I took, I mean, really, you know, I, I can't understate how important the interim band head of David was. Because right. um, Head of David were, you know, when I before I joined that band, I was a fan of that band. And they were playing Birmingham. This is before they got signed by Blast First. And Blast First was owned by Mute Records. And Blast First were releasing, like, Sonic Youth. Um, they released uh, the first Dinosaur Junior over there, but they took it, licensed it from SST. Uh, they were releasing, like, uh, Band of Susans eventually. and um, But, yeah, Sonic Youth... Yeah, yeah was one of their first big things. And when I, when I joined Head of David, they'd already had released their first album, you know, which is LP, which is one of my favorite albums ever made, you know. And um, it was a complete fucking inspiration. I'd go watch this band in front of six people at the Mermaid pub. We were playing in front of more people as Napalm Death when na nobody knew the fuck Napalm Death was, because we were supporting like, the UK subs or we were supporting conflict. Right, right. People would often come to laugh at us because we were like a kid band who played super fast. You know what I mean? So at yeah. first people were just laughing. Oh, it's this fucking bunch of stupid ass kids. They play songs like, one of their songs is one second long. We were like, a, we were a laughing stock, you know? But eventually we weren't. People fucking started taking this quite seriously and we took ourselves quite seriously. And once we did, we saw people flock into this sound, you know what I mean? I remember thinking, what the fuck is happening here? Yeah. Um, yeah. And obviously for me, you know, this melting pot of music, I didn't see, I was, really interested in extremely tribal musics and the singularity of tribal musics. But I was always, for me, I was I always failed at trying to be that singular. There was always too much on the peripheral that I was wishing to get in, but it felt entirely organic as a kid. And it always has done. It hasn't felt like, as soon as I overthink anything, it's fucked generally. It falls on its, flat on its face, you know. Um, and I've made, you know, many of those albums 
where there's been songs or whatever, where I've, I know I've, I've overthought the process, you know. I, I assure you're more than familiar with, you know, the way that, that, that can go yourself, you know, as an artist, you know, as soon as, you know, expe expectation on any level comes into your music, it, it changes things. Obviously, it's really hard to get that distance again and, you know, and try and <coughs> get the perspective of what it was like making music in a vacuum which for me is still absolutely important. You know, this is why I still record all my own music pretty much on my own. I don't have any producers. I don't work with anyone because I want to try and consistently achieve the magic that I felt of when I'd always create on my own in an in, in a, completely in a fucking vacuum within in my own four walls, um, you know, for right or for wrong. You know, I, I, it doesn't bother me. People, well, I should use a producer. It could do this. It could do that. Well, so what? You know what I mean? So people say, oh, you sell another fucking, put another zero on your sales. Doesn't, it's meaning, it's meaningless really because I'm not, you know, just compromise. It, it, you know, I just, as soon as anything um, compromises the purity, I think of what you, you're trying to achieve, you know, especially when you think of critics, audiences, uh, and so on. It's just a fucking annoyance, you know. I, that's what I find. It's just like I really want to make this in a fucking vacuum. I've always been trying to, and I still can achieve that now. I've done it by via isolation, you know. So it's like you know, and so on. So, but yeah, yeah. I digress. <laughs> I'm still trying to say how important Head of David was. No man. Head of David, oh man, my, my God, man. That band. We got Dave, one of our one of our friends, Dave Cochran. We got him in Head of David in the end, which was fucking awesome. So we ended up on the first album because we go watch them, and when Blast First signed them, they were the only English band on Blast First, you know. Because and in Mute Offices, then I remember going down there. I was already a huge Swans fan, you know. And um, the guy that uh, K four two two had put out all the Swans records in uh, in Europe as well. His office was next door, so we'd lurk between the Blast First office and the K four two two office and be. It was such an inspiring period. And that whole thing of American No Wave at the time, you know, like Big, Big Black. Uh, we were a part of that as Head of David. But I thought Head of David had a fucking singular voice amongst it because it had this perversion of metal, you know. The, the guitarist in Head of David, Eric, he had this fucking sound, which was untrue, absolutely untrue. And he inspired my God, my Godflesh sound almost entirely. But the funny thing with Eric is everybody else wrote his guitar parts. He didn't write the guitar parts himself. He barely wrote anything himself. He was a fucking learned metal guitarist. It was incredible. But what we do when we did writing sessions, I learned this when they did LP, it was Ruben, the vocalist, the drummer Sharp, who I replaced, and Dave Cochran, who we got in the band because he was a mate of ours and they advertised for a fucking bass player. We literally got him in there. Um, but he was like, you pass around his guitar sound. It was his sound. I'd be like, whoa, look at his fucking sound. We we're writing riffs. I remember writing uh, the main riff for Dog Day Sunrise. It's like a song that Fear Factory covered and stuff. It became quite a big song. Um, never, never for Head of David, but it was, you know, it, it, it come back for the Head of David for that, which was fantastic. Thanks to Fear Factory's popularity at that period. But um, it was a fucking sound. It was the texture. He had this fucking sound. It was untrue. Um, what we wrote with that sound, because he had this weird fucked up metal sound, but we delay on it and all this sort of shit. And he used the heavy metal pedal, the HM2, which was what inspired me to use the HM2. Right. Um, right. You know, that was it. I was like, well, yeah, I'm, I'm ripping that. I'm taking that with me. When, when they kicked me out of Head of David, because they wanted to become more conservative, they kicked me out for being a noisy bastard. That was, <laughs> that was Ruben, God bless him, the vocalist said, you're out because you're a noisy bastard. So all the, <laughs> the, the, the songs I was writing for Head of David before they kicked me out, I took into I was like right I said with Ben I was like we're gonna form this new band okay I, we're gonna get fucking normal. we're gonna get a drum machine we're, we're fucking poor we're on the doll me and Ben lived in a room together that that fucking thing now Ben's mom <laughs> and his stepdad they they got a loan for us so we could buy that drum machine on a loan and we it took us like in fact it was amazing because we bought it and we thought we're gonna be paying this off for like yeah you know, <laughs> Two years, because nobody's going to buy our fucking music. Do you know what I mean? And Real. we literally paid it off about two months later because yeah. we suddenly, suddenly people, John Peel played us, you know, the fucking week the album came out. And, it, you know, we were suddenly, oh, that was the 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 less, that was the replacement, which I, I, I really hated that machine, to be honest. <laughs> I only really liked It doesn't look that. as good either. 
and that's the that, that's the fucking one though. Yeah, this is that, the OG. That, that's the yeah, because that was the that's the OG. Yeah, totally. Because for you know, for me, because I was so obsessed with everything being low pitched, I couldn't believe that you could fucking layer like four kick drums and pitch them all down to minus twelve. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I was just like in my element, you know, because it was like. I remember saying to Ben, like, I want everything to sound like it's been pitched down. I want everything yeah. to sound like, I wanted that Head of David template, but te- Head of David was, uh, there you go. Um, Head of David was like concert pitch. You know, it was completely, you know, EA, DJ, you know, all the rest. But I remember being obsessed with wanting to low tune. I remember hearing a Black, Black Sabbath being at C sharp. I'd ne- never really heard that much, but I was also into the metal side of things. Like I thought Celtic Frost, I think, oh, they must have low tuned somewhat. And then uh, I remember being into bands, you know, early doom metal, like um, Trouble and stuff like that. And um, I was like, fucking hell, how is this so low? Obviously, you've just got to take the strings. I remember literally well, one time we just took everything down until it was spaghetti and then <laughs> brought it back up. We didn't even use tuners and we just brought it up to, you know, it's like, really? Yeah, we, we can play. I mean, pitch all the drums down as much as possible. I remember going in the studio and saying uh, the first time I, I, I want to didn't know about pitch shifters then like what you could do to your voice do you know what I mean? I remember going in the studio and saying uh, my, my, my trying to trying to tell the guy that I wanted to sound like Pinhead from Hellraiser. I said, how the fuck can I pull, pull this off, man? It's like pitch stuff. And obviously they showed me pitch shifters and shit. And um, the rest was history in that regard. But this is where Skinny Bobby comes into that because obviously when we toured with uh, with you guys <laughs> and every night I was like. Fucking listen to them vocals, man. <laughs> um, and we us going up to rave, Dave Ogilvy, and being like, what, what, "What's he what, got? Hey, what have you got? What's what's in the what's, what's the box of tricks here? Eventide. There it is. And if my cam could move, it's literally sitting beside me. Oh yeah, this thing's a, still a classic. You can't get rid oh, of this guy. My God, we said, oh. we went back home and we're like, right, if we can ever afford one, we're having one in the studio. Fortunately, obviously, we got signed by Sony Columbia for the Selfless album. First thing we did was buy one of them. Yeah, and it's expensive. Sitting, literally sitting next to me now. I've had it since 1994. It's never been serviced once. It sounds as good now as it did in yep. 1994. Incredible. Brilliant. Incredible. Thanks, thanks to you guys. Um, basically, thanks to you and, you know, and not being precious about uh, what equipment you use. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't like... No, we ain't, we, ain't, we ain't telling you that shit. <laughs> What's so, this, what about um your guitar? You've got now like a, uh, there's a custom Justin Broderick Blackheart guitar, eight string. I guess you can get uh, spaghetti going on that. Oh, oh no, that's, that's, that was, that, that's, that that's, only lasted, that's that only cool. lasted for about six months. I did. I, I, okay. I'm like, yeah, that's a, a long story, which didn't come out very well. I didn't like the guitars in the end. And, uh, and so on, and all the rest of it. And what, what uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> what about this guy? Oh, Jesus. I, I, I think I used that briefly because a, a pedal broke. Some set of pedals broke on a Yezu tour. I think I rushed out and got one yeah. and found a tone at a sound check and somehow it stuck with me. It's uh, pretty much, it's pretty rough, really. But I always claim, you know, if you know your own tone and you're at least using your amps, ooh. Uh, <laughs> at least if you're using like uh, you know because i'd always swear by you know jc mate 100 i always said as long as i'm using a guitar that is somewhat an approximation of my old fender strat in some ways um and i'm using a marshall jc mate 100 and a marsh uh, a marshall old 4b12 but you know opposite to that with the band Yezo, i use orange gear um because i wanted a different tone a warmer tone for that but um you know, these sort of pedals, you know what it's like. You buy some of this shit, it's just out of necessity. Because, and, and then suddenly you're like, it works. It actually, I can get my tone out of that. And you'll, you'll spend X amount of time playing gigs with opening bands with way more lucrative sets of equipment and coming up to me and going, you use that. You know what I mean? Be like, that's a fucking piece of shit. You know what I mean? I'll be like, yeah. But then they'll hear the tone and go, well, yeah, well, that I, works. That's, that's, I love that theory. I, I think that's the best theory. Is you're using that? Oh, fuck. Uh, and then people are going out and searching for it. Yeah. Uh, are, are you still using this pedal? Never. It's so funny. You know, that I, still people ask me now, like... Um, we use you know, this pedal. I thought you used this pedal too. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, you know, I swore by it until, 
uh, I think I stopped using it in, oh yeah, I mean, you know, exclusively until about yeah. 1996. Yeah. After that, I think I, I about three of the, I had about three at the end and they, they all broke. Uh, you could barely yeah. find anyone to fucking fix them. Um, and when you did, the tone seemed to change. And then uh, I, I don't think I ever used one after about 1997. I've never any, you know, uh, even towards the end of Godflesh, I definitely didn't use one from what I, I can recall on the last couple of Godflesh albums. And then obviously then after we split up and eight, nine, 10 years later or whatever, I've never used it since. But Ben, you we've, you know, with Ben's bass sound, we've used it since fucking day one, you know. Right, yeah. And it will never, never not be that sound because that's the sound. Yeah. Thought that's it was the sound. We modeled that sound using that pedal. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And it, was, and it was the whole purpose was how much can we make it sound like uh, JJ Bennell from the Stranglers? And that was it. That's the only bass sound for me that counts in the world. <laughs> it's a slight exaggeration. <laughs> but that, that was it, you know. That really, that's, that's you know, that uh, our bass tone is, is JJ Bennell from the Stranglers because that's my hero of uh, bass. Of all time, there's nothing, nothing fucking like that sound. Isn't isn't that what you made? You had a quote that someone said that we all started from witchcraft, Nazis, and stranglers cassettes. Jesus Christ, that's brutal, isn't it? Well, I think I think, uh, that, I, I think that was, uh, you're making reference to uh, what your your grandmother or something. Yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, that's a combination yeah. of. Very I think that's. I, th I, I think that is. A, 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 um, a particularly sensationalist, uh, slightly misinterpreted quote from Kerrang. Oh yeah, probably. Not. I think I did a Kerrang interview where they, you know, you know, these classic like, like Justin Broadway, the uh, witchcraft, Nazis and Stranglers cassettes. <laughs> yeah, this, that's it. I mean, I think that was it. I think it, at that interview, because I, I remember seeing that in Kerrang, I think it's about 1994 or something okay. like that. But I remember being quite horrified by the quote at the time because it was, it pretty much everything was out of context and you know it was what but it was i think what he was getting at was um my mom was born in germany in 1947 and my my grandmother uh was married to a british soldier who who rescued her in berlin uh at the end of the war um she was uh put in a concentration camp uh and before that she was threatened to be killed she was a journalist um, she was threatened to be killed by the brown shirts who hung her by the legs out of a window of a tower block. And uh, they said to her, Heil Hitler, or we drop you. So she shouted Heil Hitler up. They pulled her up and they said, you're working for the fucking brown shirts. So she was a journalist for the brown shirts, which is pretty fucking brutal. Yeah. Uh, and, and of course they fucked her over and ended up, she was in a concentration camp for X amount of time. It completely fucked this woman's life up. Um, but fortunately, after another set of horror stories in her life at the end of the war, she was in Berlin. Uh, she got rescued by my granddad um, and they moved to Bielefeld in Germany and they had two daughters there. And then he brought her back to Birmingham in England. And um, uh, my, yeah, my mum and her, one of her sisters, one of the her later sister was born in Birmingham. Uh, and 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 yeah, so I'm a product of that. But uh, during all this, my nan was also uh, a practicing white witch, um, and she was in 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 Germany. She belonged to a full cauldron, and you know, the details. Now, obviously, my my nan's long gone. You know, she she died in like '99, and my granddad was about '96 while I was on tour. While I was on tour in ministry, of all people, actually, oh, no. my granddad died when we were on tour in ministry in Europe, we were playing the Milky Way in Amsterdam. He died that night. I remember dedicating the set to him and shit oh, and talking to, talking to all the ministry about it. You know, Al and uh, Paul, was, Paul was still around then, Paul Barker as well. But, but, um, but yeah, she was, uh, I heard, you know, as a kid, the stories I heard amongst manic drug taking, all the shit you've already heard. My nan's stories were, and she was, you know, she was pretty fucking bitter from these experiences, but the shit... The shit I heard as a kid was just fucking horrifying. Um, and I think it, it obviously filtered through everything for me, you know. Um, but obviously, I opened my mouth about that in a Krang interview who were looking for sensationalist. Uh, and how the Strangler, I guess Strangler's Live cassettes came into that conversation somehow at that time. Well, no, I remember at that time, that's how you had to get music was someone had to give you a cassette of a record that they had, that they had and that's 
how, yeah. how you got them. You couldn't buy the record. You could just get somebody get you a cassette. Well, and, this is it. Yeah. I mean, you're from the set. That's the generation that's yourself. Terrible. It's brilliant. Home, 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 tape, home taping is killing music. Yeah. <laughs> but no, yes, the bootleg cassettes. You know, I was a, a phone collector of bootleg tapes. Yeah. Um, and would lurk around a, a, a tape stall as a young kid that I had, you know, every, every, I, I was there. That was how I discovered Throbbing Gristle. You know, I heard um, Industrial Records cassette number six, them okay. live in Brighton in 76 okay. or something. Life-changing fucking moment for me. One of the most brutal Throbbing Gristle live performances out there as well. Like, utterly fucking unforgiving. And you um, like Nocturnal Emissions as well, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Is, is that Tissue of Lies? Or, uh, no, it's not Tissue of Lies, is it? It's um, Drowning in a Tea of a sea of bliss. Uh, I do have only in a sea of bliss. There's tissue of lies, isn't it? Yeah, amazing fucking records. These ones, yeah, man, they really changed my life too. Oh, absolutely. We connected over that. It is the fucking. Yeah, I think that's one of the first things we, we were talking about. Absolutely, missions and and Bur Br Burmese quark or something. You know, like old British industrial music. But yeah, this yeah. is here's the fucking mad thing. I already had a massive working knowledge of that sort of stuff, and I was into that cassette culture. You know, my first project final was was power electronics. It was completely inspired yep. by all the extreme electronics of the period. Um, this is, you know, before I joined Napalm Death and stuff. Um, but um, uh, who I always slept on, which is ridiculous because I was so obsessive with just extreme electronics. Who you turned me on to was fucking Zoviet France. Oh, yeah. Of course. You, we came away from that. You, you were just like, I remember you saying to me, like, you must love Soviet France. And I remember being, who's that? I've, I've, you know, for some reason, I've skipped them, always skipped them, because I, I thought they had this sort of ethno -y sort of thing I might not like at the time, because I was such a fucking grey industrial music fan. Yeah, you were the opposite, I mean? opposite of everything we were doing. Yeah. That's why and I think I liked it so much, I think. You played them to us. We yeah. got stoned in uh, one, one of the hotel rooms one night, of course. Of but course. you you invited us up. Dwayne was there. Ogre wasn't there. It was me, you, Ben, Dwayne, fleetingly, maybe a few, you know, a few other characters. Some nice, you know, lots of not, and some nice people. We got super stoned, and you played Soviet France. So I remember me and Ben just looking at each other like, "Oh <laughs> shit! How the fuck have we slept on this?" And uh, we subsequently got home and like bought every single thing by Soviet France. And they remain one of my favorite, uh, uh, you know, acts of all time. Like. Uh, Absolutely fucking. I, I heard this recently. Um, this Burmese Quark 1980 to 86 box set. Oh, it it's fantastic. Yeah. Put out by, um, uh, God, I can't remember who put this out, but man, such a oh, brilliant. Vinyl on demand. It's got to be vinyl on demand. Those yeah, guys. Vinyl on demand. Yeah. VOD. Brilliant. I, brilliant. I mean, I have to say, like, I think they become like, over time, they've aged so well that all the material, if, if you listen to it, it's just, it, it almost seems like, like, do you have that feeling when you go back and listen to your material now, like say with final, with the first stuff you were making or stuff and you hear it differently now for, and, and, and say to, I mean, I like Absolutely. saying to myself, wow, how did I do that? Oh, well, can I go back and do that again? Or yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I get, it's like 50% that and 50% like, uh, oh shit. But then, and then I'm like, oh. <laughs> Thank God I haven't released any of this stuff just yet, but I am compiling all that older extreme electronics uh, final stuff that I used to release on set back in the day. Some of it turns up on YouTube and shit like that, but I wanted to remaster all this stuff, you know, and give it some sort of, but there's loads of fucking awful stuff as well. But it's a lot of it I used to listen to so much that even now when I play a cassette of something I made in say late 1983, I still know every fucking nuance of it. It's bizarre. I still don't seem to be able to remove me as this fucking 13 year old, 14 year old from it. It's like the distance, it's like really weird. I, I still feel very connected to it. Like as if it was fucking, you know, yesterday or some shit, which is, which is fucked up really, but, uh, but yeah, yeah, but I, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Talk about being prolific though. I mean, ever since uh, uh, I met you and, uh, you know, obviously keep track of all the things you're doing, man, it's like, unbelievable amount of stuff just so prolific um yeah like depending <laughs> on the day like you get up and like on a certain day um you feel like um something will be a technic uh, techno animal track or on a certain day be yezu or um i love jk flesh man the post-human oh, album awesome 
Idle Hands and Knuckle Dragger, um, The Suicide Estate. I love that album. Oh, you like that? I didn't. I, I didn't know you was. I didn't know you was into the other stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's no, no. I, I, I can. I feel you in it. I always say it's like it's. It's what I love about it is that it's not just one, one palette. You're going like you cannot guess yeah. where you're gonna go with Jake. Yeah, I, I always think it's uh, to me it's it's many shades of grey. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> every every possible permutation of I, I mean, with white, white and black and all, and the the multitude of, of uh, in between. Uh. I really but, like um, in in Yesu, uh, like friends are evil and terminus. Like especially even the vocals in in, in on uh, friends are evil. Like you know, the soft, friendly. the soft, uh, the but soft electronic soft focus. I, love it. I, I loved it. I thought this is this is uh, you know, uh, you know, you got a fan in me. Um, I remember you telling me um, it was it was obviously years. It was probably it was probably mid two thousands that you 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 were into the Azu stuff. I remember being like, "Fuck, awesome!" Because you know I obviously got a lot of shit with Azu at first. I think as soon as I start, you know, because obviously my legacy is extreme music, you know. So I'm 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 always going to be, a, 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 you know, everybody see, sees me through. Um, I wish I was more articulate tonight. Um, everybody sees me through the extreme music filter, you know. So obviously doing anything where suddenly I'm singing or attempting to sing, initially was met with all manner of derision. Obviously it was like, you know what I mean? It was just like people just, you know, you, you've got to be monochrome, you know what I mean? You've, you've got to be, you've got to be, you know, so you're selling out or some shit, you know, or, or whatever, you know, it's like, how can you not be that guy? And it's, it's something that's fucking you know, really frustrated me. You know, that expression for me comes thick and fast, you know. I mean, all I have is a creative brain. I mean, incapable of uh, no, no, normal life to me is, you know, is, is fucking, I, I don't get it. You know what I mean? But but all, all I think of is in terms of creation, you know, that's that's it. And that, that's my moments as well. It's when I, I'm actually in the moment as well, you know, I'm actually finally here and it transcends the fucking all the rest of the shit. So for, for me, it's absolutely imperative that I consistently create, you know, it's, it's, and, and, and I'm always, always creating. There's never, you know, a, a day won't go by where I have something, you know, there's, there's something, I'm working something, or if I try to take time off, you know, with, with my family or whatever, um, I'm always coming back to my own time, my own zone. And I'm always thinking music. I'm always thinking art, you know, I'm always thinking creation, yeah. So I can never... And for me, it's just one big pool, you know, that I'm constantly dipping into and trying to be better at, you know, for myself. Um, so it's always, you know, and I'm, I'm highly sensitive to the way, I mean, you just, you're just going to make sure you don't read anybody else's opinion, you know, whether it be critics or fans or whatever, you know, so it's rule number one, don't listen to fucking anyone. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, when I do, it really upsets me. I'm like, what the fuck am I yeah, doing? You don't read that, man. Just like, don't, it's like, Aaron Funk told me like the reason that he makes music is strictly for himself. He yeah. doesn't fuck what anyone thinks and he yeah, never, yeah. You know. and so that's, that's why, you know, he, he, he rarely will even talk about his music. He said, because he just doesn't, he just wants his music to be interpreted the way, you know, it is. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 I, 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 that from you. It's like, just tell people to fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> Stick with your guns. You're always, you, you know, 20 years from now, people are making references even still. And like, you know, I don't know. I, I I just think it's great that that you're that prolific, though. Um, you're known to also collaborate with a number of, of really talented people: uh, Kevin Martin, or Alec Empire, Porter Ricks, um, Mick Harris. Uh, uh, you know, what did you did you work with Mike Patton at, at any time? What did we, did we, were we on something together? God, you've got me now. No, he released um, The Curse of the Golden... We did we did this project. It was actually me, Kevin Martin, and Alec Empire called Curse of the Golden Vampire. Yeah, yeah. We did that on um, Alec's uh, label, Digital Hardcore Recordings. But we did the second one. It ended up just me and Kevin through all manner of odd politics that went on. But that was for Mike Patton's label, uh, Ipecac. Oh, great. Um, I don't think... Did me and Mike ever do anything together? We've been on some. We've, we've been on some of the same records, surely. I think. Yeah. But you got me there. Sometimes I do so much, I end up getting confused about what I have and haven't done. Yeah, I would Often think people, that would be you know, so interesting, though. That would be that'd be something I'd really love to hear. I mean, yeah, his stuff with Fantomas, especially that gig he did with T Terry Bozio, 
quite a few years back, eight or nine years oh, ago. Oh, shit, yeah. Check it out. It's Terry Bazio with Fantomas in Switzerland. You won't believe it. It's a whole set. I know. I haven't seen that. because It'll blow he, your yeah. mind. Okay, tonight or tomorrow morning. Yeah. He re- obviously, he replaced Dave Lombardo for, for a minute then. I wasn't even aware he of that. Was, oh. Dave Lombardo wasn't there. It was Terry Bazio, but with yeah. uh, Buzz and the guys. But, man, oh. it, it is, it's absolutely the, one of the greatest things I've ever witnessed. Shit. So you also toured with, uh, yeah, as you were saying earlier, Ministry, Typo, Negative, um, uh, you know, in the sense of like working with these other bands, like in that sense and, and, and touring with them, how much do, the, do, you, do, you, do you absorb? Like, are you tour with Skinny Puppy? And what, what do you walk away from when you tour with these other bands? Do you, do you, do you, do you say, well, I'm never going to do that. I'm never going <laughs> to I mean, to be honest, the tour with Skinny Puppy is what for us, and this is no fucking, I'm not shitting you at all. It's one of our favorite tours ever. I mean, oh, like, wow. we, we had such a fun time, though, didn't we? We're fucking amazing, yeah. And everything just felt so fucking open. We felt really welcome. We felt like we were all in this together, literally. You would have done anything for us and we would have done anything for you. Um, and we just became one big clan gang. with, And we were all on this big fucking open level we're all doing lots of good hallucinogenics and fucking too much weed. Um, and we just shared so much and we shared a stage importantly. And, and we watched you, you know, every fucking night if we could, and we're consistently blown away. And it was just one of those most amazing experiences. We come away with so much from that. It was so inspiring. Unfortunately, our, our next big tour, of the US was about a year and a half later. It was when we supported Type of Negative and Danzig. We were opening that bill. Now, both bands loved us. You know, we were, we were there at the invite of both bands absolutely adored us. You were blowing but, them uh, off the stage. <laughs> fucking, but the audience, I mean, Jesus, about 80% of the audience despised us. So as opposed to it opening any doors, I think it more fucking closed doors. It was like a fucking war scene. Um, and that was with a, a real drummer as well, you know. I mean, we had uh, Brian, Brian Mantia from, you know, from uh, Primus, uh, who went on to being Guns N' Roses, you know. He was with us, drumming with us. He's a fucking unbelievable drummer, this guy. Um, but even with a fucking real drummer, if it might, God forbid if we would have had a drum machine, we would have been fucking killed. But I think the first night, you know, and, 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 and this, this is it, like the first night we played with, with Skinny Poppy, like you said, it was like fucking huge show, but we were we we were so welcomed by the audience as well. There was no fucking, we weren't shouted at, we weren't fucking shit throwing at us. They, they loved you. The first night with Type of Negative and Danzig was like some enormous dome with uh, in Dallas again. It was it was fucking Texas, and I was getting sharpened one cent coins thrown at me. It was fucking cutting my fucking face and shit. Wow. And I remember being like, holy shit, we're really welcome here. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> People fucking despised us, and the tour was brutal. And uh, it really fucking, it, there was so many, it was horrible shit about that tour. And that started to, I mean, touring kills me anyway, but that started to yeah. really like fucking kill me. I was just like, I couldn't be in these environments anymore. And it was just living like that. I was just, I, I, I'm not cut out for that. That's the fucking shit. So, you know what I mean? It was just like, it would it just, just, just to put, damage me after a while. It just feels, it's, it's often the antithesis of creation as well, performance, I find, you know, repeated performance. Uh, it, it, you know, it lacks, it's not like I want to fucking go out and be in some improv band that, you know, I'm playing the same shit every night, you know what I mean? It's like, of course it's fucking mind numbing. But as much as that as well, environmental things, I'm so hypersensitive to who I'm around and people and their attitudes and negativity and, um you know, it's it's it would it, it, I could get upset so easily in these sort of environments. Fucking kill me that tour. Do you know what I mean? It was just like, yeah. and, it, and when you, you obviously you know you've played audiences who fucking hate you. Did Skinny Bobby did back in the day? Obviously, you know it's just like when it's war nearly every night, it becomes exhausting. It becomes really fucking tiresome when pretty much all those front rows are out of these eight thousand people or whatever fucking hate you. I mean, it's inspiring as well because we got flesh. Obviously, you know. It's defensive music. It fucking rages. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, yeah, of course. I'm raging fucking back at these fuckers and they're raging at me. You know, it was a fucking war scene. Um, it was a battleground, you know, but it's just fucking exhausting after a while. It's just tiresome. But yeah, and, uh, you know, it, we still, me, you know, Ben and I still think that I think I, our best, for him, 
you know, after that, he stayed in America after that tour. He did one, one acid trip too many. He stayed. He went back to the West Coast, you know. I left on my own. I came back. Uh, did you even know that? At the time? I'm not sure if you even knew that. Oh, but yeah, yeah. Ben left me in uh, what, like Washington, D.C. airport. I remember getting a domestic internal to New York to come home. And he just said, I'm not coming home. But I was like, wow. holy fuck. He was microdosing nearly every day on that tour. So he, he was like, now nah, I'm going to, they do, they, they, you know, the people who were with us, Shannon, our tour manager, she, she was driving back with Dave. That was that guy who we just saw in the film. And yeah. Dave was like guitar tech and, uh, you know, guy. He, they were driving back from fucking DC to, uh, to, to San Fran, you know, back to SF. And they were going to do that, you know, three and a half days or whatever the fuck it was, or longer was it? And Ben just had an army of acid and he just fucking, he just did that whole road trip back microdosing every day i went back to fucking england i actually thought this guy's never going to come back he, yeah. i'm not gonna i'll be i'll be hooking up with him in san francisco to to rehearse for our next tour do you know what i mean but uh i think um he missed home eventually and he did he did yeah. eventually come back a couple of weeks later i think but uh yeah he was uh you know he was that enamored inspired by that tour they it, it was life-changing for us you know literally life-changing i don't i don't blame him a bit it was a great era in the u.s as well Incredible. It was so much better then than it is now, let me tell you. Oh my God. <laughs> it was Fuck so it was. cheap and it was like, you know, it was like everything was still, everyone was still nice. Yeah. So, it was so open minded as well. People were so fucking open minded. You yeah. know, it's like yeah. I'm saying, like the, the, the hybrids of these musics we create. Yeah. It was much more open then than the fucking micro niches you have now. Do you know what I mean? It's like, right. imagine if Skinny Puppy Girl Godflesh came around now, it would be fucking pointless. You know, we'd exist in some subgenre micro niche, you know, that makes cassette 30 cassettes for fucking 30 dudes. You know what I mean? It would be just like, yeah. you know, it's just fucking, it's fucked. I, th I thank fuck, I am fucking grateful that we made music in the fucking 80s and 90s. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm just, yeah. I'm fucking grateful. Oh, shit. Man, I do, you know, how I've had a fucking career out of this anyway is, is beyond me. Do you know what I mean? It's just like, yeah. but, but, but yeah, I mean, I just, that was such an exciting period. It become, it became, you know, every subsequent tour we did of America became fucking worse. <laughs> it got it gets, worse and worse and worse. It gets more challenging. You think it would get better, but as we yeah. get used to how tough it is, then you realize, wait, I, there's a, there's an hour show, but the rest of the day is what is really what's the most challenging, isn't it? Yeah, abs absolutely. It's these yeah. environments, you know, it's like people, People on the other end, you know, rare, rarely sort of get it, really. Obviously, they just see you as a, a you know, stage musician or whatever. But it's uh, it's it's incredible, you know, especially if you're making music like we do and stuff. You know, it's 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 not fucking easy, you know. It's, yeah. You know what I mean? It's it's not, it, you know, you're, you're obviously extremely fucking passionate and connected to it. You know, it's like and performing it is a fucking pain. I find performing painful. You know, I could never there is no such thing as me as going through the motions. What the fuck is that? I walk off stage, you know what I mean? It's yeah. just like, I only know one way of performance. Every performance for me, it feels like it's the end. You know what I mean? It feels like, and every album I make, it feels like the end. This is the fucking end. You know what I mean? It's like, like Ben always used to say to me before we go on stage. He, he said it when we reformed as well, but he realized I'd finally become a bit more measured. But he'd say, try and take some deep breaths before the first song. Because uh. <laughs> you always just blow yourself out. You know, I'd be so full of fucking emotion. That I'm just fucking, ah, everything would just blow out. I just fucking, the analogy of shooting your load in the first, first song, you know what I mean? You'd be fucking exhausted. There'd be nothing left. You know, it'd be a fucking empty shell after that. Because so, it's, it's got to be, it's, it's, all, it's all or nothing for me. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like every, every, every day is the end for me. Every fucking album I make is the end. Every gig I make <laughs> could be the end. <laughs> absolutely love it, man. I mean, that's what I say, live, live. Every day, like it's your last, you know. You, yeah, yeah. It's, make, it's, make, it's, make, it's, you know, live, live life to the fullest. Uh, you know, Ben was already on that philosophy when it was like stayed in America, right? Well, um, this was it. it that was pretty. Uh, you know, it was it was somewhat flippant, and it was somewhat not him as well. You know, it was a real voyage of discovery. You know, and yeah. uh, he 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 was so inspired by that too. I mean, his micro dosing of acid went on for a good two years after that. You know, until he reached reached quite. Well, a now they say it's healthy. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. I saw you guys uh, the last time we <laughs> played at the Fonda, and I was so glad to see you. Oh, and we didn't fucking meet at that one, which was no. which was Why? an travesty that we didn't get was to like fucking, fucking see you. Fifteen thousand people, you know. I was like, I couldn't see. 
it's like one of those things where we had just got back from Japan and I was so jet lagged, but I still wanted to go. So we went and I was like holding my eyes open like a fuck. This is amazing. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I just knew that there was no way that I you know, could hassle with the, hey, can I go back and say hi? But, you know, but we, we, was we, we even we just, exchanged messages and we fucking missed you as well. We were disgusted yeah. with ourselves that it turned into that. But yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, so the reformation had, had shows. Take a break for a while from from God flesh, and then you guys are back now. Yeah, yeah, ex ex exactly. Yeah, I mean, um, to be honest, the the reformation shows since we started when we re, you know we started playing again. Most of the you know those shows were fucking great. They've been some of the better shows. They're actually more like the magic of the the earlier yeah. years. Yeah, I felt the, it. The toil, do you know what I mean? Yeah, but yeah. without the pain and on our own terms again, you know. Yeah. Um, which was quite exciting to, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, you know, obviously we're, we're so much older and uglier, but it's, um, you know, it, you feel more in control now. Obviously when I was, I was a mess, you know, because obviously a lot of these, you know, that's what we're saying. I was 22 when we were touring, you know, we, we did Street Cleaner, you know, obviously I wrote the album. Essentially I wrote most of Street Cleaner between the ages of 17 and 19, you know, and finally, put it together and in studio and stuff when I was like 19. I was a fucking teenager, uh, an, an extremely confused teenager. <laughs> no, with a, actually, uh, I think we're, we're not as confused as we think. Our mind yeah. is confused, but our, our, our notions are, are, are right on point. Instinct, you know what pure you instinct. Hear, you know how you want it to sound and you know how you want it to go. Yeah. You bring it. Yeah. <laughs> It's only when other people question it that I would often then right. stomp, you know, never like, ah. Oh. Never question it's, Yeah, when you're running and rolling and rolling and rolling, you know, it, it, it's, it works until, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, 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 I'm happy to see that you, you guys have toured Japan. I mean, for me, Japan is this weird place that I get this, like. Fantastic. I, it, it's different. This, is it different for you guys if you go and play there and you get a, hey, well, wait, all of a sudden it's fun? Yeah, I mean, the, the irony is, is Godflesh never went there when we existed originally. Right. Uh, but the first time I played a tour of Japan was with uh, with Yezu. Um, and it, it blew me the fuck away. You know, I, yeah, I, I, I absolutely loved it. I mean, I love the culture anyway. I already had uh, a vested interest culturally and, and in the music, you know, so all, all, all manner of culture. But um, yeah, I absolutely loved it. And it's the, the first... Um, place uh, country i'd ever performed at i don't know whether you you what was the when was the first time poppy played the first time yeah poppy played japan oh no puppy's never played japan oh you went there was it with I download? Only played there solo i've only yeah did download solo stuff there holy shit wow yeah, you've never played yeah. I, it's the one of the weird the weird things about the world yeah puppy has never yeah. played wow Yep. Well, that was you know that was the same for Godflesh back in the day in the not in the eighties, nineties, yeah. early two thousands. We never played Japan. Much more difficult then as well. If if you recall, it was a, a bit you know what I mean. It wasn't as a, totally um, but but yeah, eventually it was Yezu who played there first. Because it, it was the first country where, um, uh, basically the the road crew in Japan sound checked for us. It was truly bizarre. I remember uh, us walking back in the venue. We could hear the the um, a band sound checking. One of our songs and i walked in and they were sound checking for us i remember being like fucking awesome See? play for us if you want <laughs> but i remember it was like that's amazing <laughs> but yeah I, I adore it i adore japan i noticed that you get a lot of support from japan the japanese pressings and stuff like that and yeah yeah absolutely yeah if all my projects get you know get a lot yeah. of love and i've played with nearly most you know most of them I've, i think i've even played as final in japan i think I played as um, J.K. Flesh in Japan, um, but yeah, obviously Yezu and Godflesh have been there, you know, numerous times since. Uh, unfortunately, we, we would have went during the last the Godflesh album post self, but the pandemic you know, once the pandemic rolled in, that was the end of that. So, and it's uh, it's in tatters a bit in terms of travel, isn't it? I can't see going back to Japan for a couple of years, unfortunately. Yeah, no, it sucks. yeah fuck I really, you know. I really, I really can't wait for this. It this whole pandemic nonsense to stop. I, I miss it. I miss Japan. I, I really do. It's been been too many years now. So what's what's in the what what's next for for you, Justin? Oh fucking hell! Living, trying to <laughs> trying to trying to stay alive, and keep making it 
the albums at uh, the end <laughs> over and over again, <laughs> if possible. But yeah, no, there's, there's, uh, I've been working um, a new Godflesh album. Um, Excellent. Uh, oh, there's, oh, yeah, there was a new JK Flash album that's literally just come out about two weeks ago. Um, a new final album that I'm particularly proud of with about another three or four, <laughs> hopefully this year alone, that's stylistically in the same. But um, there's, uh, what else have I got going? Uh, numerous JK Flesh releases. Oh my God, I'm, they, they pile up. Um, Where is the best place to, to access these releases? Um, my, my Bandcamp, my Av Avalanche Band Recordings, Camp. my record label Bandcamp is pretty much a home to, um, you know, to every, every, most of this new stuff that's coming out. Also, as a central hub. Yeah, yeah, as, yeah. A, as a central hub for all these uh, projects, I think, you know, my label is pretty much, you know, because I, I, I pretty much, as, as you've probably seen, I, I nearly release everything myself now. Most, there's still some things I won't, I like to release through other labels, uh, but pretty much, you know, I release everything myself in true control addict uh, fashion. I've always been the entrepreneur, Avalanche and everything. It's, it's just incredible, man. You, you, that's how to do it. Yeah, see, I mean, it's that old DIY. It started like that for me. You know, I had a cassette label in 83, 84 and doing it all myself. And, you know, it's, it's pretty much returned full to that. I mean, you know, all the labels in between have been utterly hideous. So, um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the whole Ear 8 Records thing and all this. You know, I, I mean, yeah, if we weren't on Ear 8 Records, then Street Cleaner would have never got to fucking all these people. I mean, that, that's the truth of the matter. But, uh, but, but, you know, their, their, their way of conducting business is, is, is truly evil. And it still is, you know, even in this day and age. So we've had some horror. We suffer through all those records. Do you know what I mean? We didn't see anything, really. But, you know, I always knew that, fuck this shit. Do you know what I mean? I'm, just, I'm doing it myself. You know, there's no way on earth I'm fucking answering to these people anymore. You know what I mean? It's just like, and, and, the, and the way you're, you know, commodified and fucking manufactured and all the fucking bullshit and the industry speak, talk, fucking shit you know that 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 the, these people fucking horrible makes me so fucking angry but um but yeah but yeah yeah i've got you know and, and the god flesh I, I didn't even think this new god flesh album would come you know i thought but but yeah i you know suddenly it was just shit you know i've got I've suddenly got all the, oh, so so much music again it's ridiculous but it comes around around with me i get so fucking tired these I mean, you, you know this yourself yeah yeah i get you know you get tired of shit you, you you've got so much more ideas for the next thing but not for i get tired of projects as well i just so fucking by the time i've made an album with a project to me you know i'm making this album it's like i was saying to you it's this the last album i'll ever make <laughs> i'm not in just that project it's the last it. album i will ever make yeah yeah i put fucking everything into it absolutely fucking everything once it comes out and then it's it's not mine anymore i i lose uh my sense of identity somewhat with the record um and then if I pay attention to what people say, it just it just destroys me. You know, I just start, oh, fuck this. Shit. I'll get onto, I'll go, I'll move on then. You know what I mean? I'll be, I'll be right, I want to fucking, I'll be right onto the, ne the next thing, you know. And I, I just keep moving on, keep moving on in, um, uh, that's a nice cat. <laughs> Fisherman. Is it a Rex? It's a Rex, isn't it? Well, Is it's, a, it's a Siamese, uh, it's actually a Javanese cat. Beautiful. Oh, Very look at the face, look at the face on that. I grew up with a I grew up with a Siamese cat. My mom had um, a chocolate point Siamese when I was like, was best, yeah, beautiful, absolutely yeah. gorgeous. But I'm, I'm a, I, I became a dog person strangely, which is quite crazy. I was a cat person my whole you life. Both we have both. <laughs> we we now have both. Yeah, yeah. But I was always uh, yeah, absolutely. But I was always excluded. No, I can't have a dog. It's too needy, you know. I can't have anything that needs me that much. But um, I adore the dog. <laughs> yes. Fantastic. So Justin, what's your thoughts on Hellfest? Oh shit, oh, yeah. Man. We're there. Apart from the fact that we're together, which is going to be the highlight for me. Because okay. like I, I said, even make it, like, well, like I said to you recently, it, yeah, if it fucking happens, that's the, you know what I mean? It's like so shit. much shit going on right now. It's Ukraine. Oh. I don't know if that has any effect on it, but you know, like um there's so I, I much that yeah. there's no buses available right now, too. It's like if you try to get a bus, if you're gonna go on tour. It's like, oh, done. Real tours are fucking screwed, yeah. I mean, you know, I've, 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 I mean, as Godflesh, as any of my projects, we performed once 
in Leeds, which is like fucking, you know, 120 miles from here. That's to be performed once in two years, which for me is the biggest gap I've ever experienced oh, wow. in performing since I was 13 years old. Yeah. That's crazy. We've done one show. How about you? Have you performed in these last two years? I did one gig last year, a DJ set, and it felt weird. But that's it. Yeah, this this was fucking weird. This was God yeah. Flesh as well, do you know what I mean? And I, I often DJ myself, you know, as Joko Flesh and stuff, I DJ in, you know, yeah. real clubs in fucking, you know, techno clubs and shit. Yeah. Um, I haven't done any of that. Like, the, yeah. the, 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 that's, just, that is just out at the minute. Um, I was offered lots of stuff, but even during the pandemic, I was like, I can't fucking deal with this. Can't deal with travel during this stuff and and, and so on, yeah. So, but uh, hopefully, it fucking hell, if it happens, we're still only a few months from it, but my God, I think it's it'll only, be quite. It's only a couple of months away. And it's like, it's kind of like getting daunting to, well, for us, especially over here, because we've got a crew of 10 and we've got oh, like a fucking shipping of all that big. Oh. It's like, it's like, it's quite a, anyways, if I don't end up seeing you there, it's going to be like this concert, the concert that was supposed to happen that never happened. Exactly. Remember this? Yeah. Oh shit! This was you know like, what? after our '92 tour. We were supposed to head off to Europe with you, and then that didn't happen. And that was such a what? fucking letdown. What? I, I can't even remember oh. what the fuck happened. I can't remember. I can't even remember. You know, we, at all. We, Ogre got injured, and then we 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 were like, we ran into a shitload of bad luck. And I don't know where it came from, but let me tell you, I think you you were with us on tour the day that we were playing uh, in Kansas. Uh, what city yeah. in Kansas were we playing? It wasn't- uh, It was Lawrence. City. Lawrence? Yeah, it was Lawrence, Kansas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And one of the people said, hey, you guys want to go see Stull? And I'm like, what's Stull? They said, well, we'll take you there. And so they took us there. And what it is, is like yeah. this- I remember. We didn't come. Yeah, you're lucky we you didn't go, Justin. Otherwise, you'd be sitting sitting here with a broken leg and fucking, like, I swear to you that it yeah. brought an immense amount of bad luck. You remember this organ that we got there, that I got there that day? Yeah, look at that. Yeah, it's all coming back now. Yeah, I put this there that day in Lawrence, and I used, to, I used to have it in the T-shirt truck, but anyways, I pulled it out with you once, and we would sit around and talk, but, like, I got that there, so I was figured, like... Wow, I remember it, yeah. The story of Stahl is that building up here is like supposed to be one of the seven gateways to hell. Yeah, I remember this. Oh, I remember declining going. <laughs> and then, so we went there and Ogre and Dwayne and a couple of other guys went in and I thought like, oh shit, this, this gotta be bad luck. I remember Jolly Roger was saying, man, this is the worst decision we've ever made. Shit. And truly after that, we had one hell of a lot of bad luck. So I don't know if like going to Stull really had anything to do with it, but man, I've heard that Stull's gone now. It's it's crazy because we've recounted some of that to people before. And we've recounted the fact that Ben and I declined, and I'm not even sure why. But obviously, it was a, a quite a, a, it wasn't an informed decision, but it was quite because I remember the following. I don't think we performed together the following day. Might have been a day off or some shit. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember where we went after. But I remember the organ, now, now you've just showed it to me, but I remember as well that everybody felt really uneasy about the experience. Oh, they did. And it, it wasn't a comfortable experience. So I remember Ben and I being like, thank fuck. So because, yeah, because there was, our, everyone, was, everyone was talking about, let's go there on acid. Yeah, yeah, no, that would probably be. Uh, I mean, I okay, thinking, so yeah. the first thing that no I saw when we got out of the truck and walked towards the church was a giant long black snake. And then some oh. people kept some bricks from it and kept it on the bus. And Jolly said, "Get fuck, those bricks are freaking me out. And so I've always thought like, a, you know, it's a little bit of a weird thing. You know, the story is, is that at the bottom of this church, there was a stairway, which was bottomless. Basically, it would lead down to hell or something like that. And oh, they eventually, they eventually burnt this thing down. But um, so after that, we had like our whole thing with the process album and like and basically the band ended up splitting up and basically like that pretty much all yeah. after that and so yeah. it was basically a nightmare but um incredible yeah i mean it was it, it was uh and lost way days in history that um i remember talking to you about it though 
It was, oh, uh, we, it, it wasn't, it was the most fun thing. And then we should have done that tour, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> It's incredible because I remember now even seeing the itinerary for, for the for the European tour. And it was that close, wasn't it? We were yeah, really was. doing that tour. I remember yeah. being so excited about that. It was, you know, we were gonna recreate the tour in Europe, you, you know. But what a fuck. And then and then we lost Dwayne and fucking so yeah. yeah. See, you know, it went one, it went one after the other after the other. It was like that just seemed like a really long string of bad luck. Yeah, ending in Dwayne's yeah. death. Fuck and you. so yeah, so Really, it was, it, it, it was terrible. You know, I never really forgot about it. Fuck. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking hell. That's who it is. Yeah, so that's it. Yeah. Exactly. Like you say, you, you eventually reached the process and things. It it, it, it went. Yeah. It was. It was. Uh, it, it was uh, a, yeah, it's... a extreme high. But then when I started thinking about, hey, why is things going weird? I kept on thinking about those bricks that Fuck. they brought on the bus. I thought, like, ah, oh, shit. But I never forget that night as well. I never forget it, and the way that you know it was like let's 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 get, let's all go down. Because I remember the show. You see, I remember the venue we played. It was some yeah, really old too. theater, very very old fucking screwed up building. I remember getting a real weird like that was a quite a positive vibe from that place. But I remember this all this oh. talk about and going now nah, we're not going totally to that. positive gig. As a matter of fact, Danny Carey, uh, drummer of Tool, basically Tool? told me he was at that gig and he said that that gig changed his life i thought like wow Holy i always shit. always considered that the big kit Fucking that i had hell. a massive inspiration so i thought like wow well, that's cool you know, wow cool. yeah yeah, yeah. Back on somebody yeah <laughs> <laughs> Fucking right. those shows i mean skinny puppy on that tour though was fucking unbelievable man it, it was the it, was, it, was, it was wild absolutely fucking wild the stage you know the stage the show uh, the, you know, musically first and foremost, but you know the whole performance, uh, ogres costumes. Oh my god, yeah! It was... The only thing I regret is that I think I had 115 dB monitors, and so I think I still have tinnitus from that tour. Oh shit, you know. How are your ears? Well, strange you ask that because I've now on my fourth week of lightheadedness. Uh, not really dizziness, more lightheadedness, but I mean, the, the two blur so much and a persistent, but very underlying high pitch that I know I've had for years, Yeah, but it, it's definitely come up a little more and there's a slight roundness to my hearing, but it's, it's all, I often get my ears syringed. Like I'm often getting my fucking earwax, yeah. particularly when I'm performing over and over. I might wear ear protection and shit, but you know, I spent a number of years there where, I, where I'd use a piece of toilet paper in my fucking ears. Because <laughs> I wanted, because I wanted to hear the the, the the heat of the marshal, you know. I'd often be like, if I wear fucking full earplugs here, I'm not connected to the my my sound anymore, and that the heat that I refer to as electric heat that comes from the guitar stack that I I have to connect with and texturally, it feels like it's connected organically to me. Quite literally, feels like about my fucking body. If you remove that, I, I I'm nullified. It feels like I'm not presence anymore you know what i mean as is probably shares you with the, how fucking loud those monitors were it's because you want to feel as connected as possible as humanly possible to the music to your output it's like i don't want to hear that at like you know a fucking phone volume you yeah. know what i mean of course oh, those of us uh, passion exactly at the time it's just turn it up and you're just yeah oh, yeah what yeah 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 and now like uh, so so if you you have are you stricken? Are you, are you stricken with tinnitus now? Oh, for sure. You, for yeah. sure. But I, you know, it's funny when you have it, you get used to it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm reading about it is that sometimes I'll be sitting in a room with a, you know, a stereo or something and there'll be like this audible hum. Yeah. Somebody else or a buzz. And they'll be like, don't you hear that? And I'll be like, what? <laughs> One of my friends yeah. put a microphone up to the speaker and put headphones on me and said this. And it was like, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was yeah. like, oh, shit. turn down yeah. that channel on the mixer. Yeah, I, I've I, been told I don't have that 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 ailment in the studio when I'm working, but for some reason it can happen to me outside my studio. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm finding exactly the same at the yeah. moment. I am assuming I'm about. It's really impossible to get into any form of healthcare over here at the minute without, like, you know, like, which is an after effects of the pandemic. Obviously, you know, it's knocked as you know, it's knocked everybody's shit back. Um, it's really hard to fucking get it seen to, but I've had four weeks of, of essentially dizziness, but without any of the, fortunately, without any of the uh, more life-threatening things you do read next to 
the obvious things. But, you know, the, the, the constant high pitch that's under now is way more prominent since I've had this dizziness. Uh, it's, it's not affecting me in the studio thus far, which, which is good. But I'm hoping to get fully diagnosed over the next week or so because I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm assuming this is it, you know, basically I'm assuming I've got it. Which is, you know, for the first time in the amount of years I've been playing such bombastically loud music, I, I guess I'm probably fortunate it's took this long, you know. But I've always had something underneath, yeah, no. but, but this is significant now. And I know that when tinnitus first comes on, dizziness or lightheadedness is a big part of it, isn't it? So, and yeah. I've got that swimminess now when I'm walking. You gotta stay well with that. Yeah. Quickly touching on Hellfest one more time. You guys have played Hellfest before, right? Oh, yeah. I played it as Yezu was the first time. Um, Godflesh. We did, oh my God, we did our Reformation show was at Hellfest. Right. Which was a big failure. We played like 20 minutes or something and all manner of shit went wrong, which was uh, sort of classic Godflesh in a way, you know. Yeah. Real punk rock style, everything broke down. Just so much stupid shit happened. But that was our Reformation show. So yeah, we played it numerous times really. Um, And once again, here we are, yeah. (laughs) So so, but does it seem like a safe place to go back with this whole COVID thing the way you, you remember it? Hellfest. Yeah. It's um it's fucking huge. It's 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 one of those enormo fests, isn't it? It's like you you've never played it. No. Yeah, I mean it's like I mean one of the last times Godflesh played, like, you know, on the main stage was like Kiss and Alice Cooper, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So it was like it's that sort of environment where it's very sort of um yeah, you know, it's very corporate as well, but very very, very uh it's fucking brilliantly put together. It's extremely fucking, you know, totally professional, amazing. Uh, but it's a, it's a big mix of uh, people. You've, you know, I don't know how they're going to keep things. To, well, it's a corporate festival. I think there's a lot of money in it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I see it as being all safe. Finding one another will be a laugh. It would be quite a laugh to try, because I know you're, you're playing the old main stage, you know, with uh, Killing Joke and Nine Inch Nails and stuff, but we're, we're off. Who fucking knows where with Atari Teenage, right? So we're going to have to try and, you know, it's yeah, going to be yeah. a recon, recon to... Uh, if we make it. I can't say 100% exactly. I'm sure if our manager is going to, like, drop the bomb or, or whatever. This I know. It's going to be imminently. You'll find out imminently. But I know, I know. There's so many... Let so me hug you now. I'm hugging you now. Exactly, because that might be... That might Have be a it. good show. Have a good set. Because Could be I, another... But we may not be there either because of this shit. Yeah, so. yeah, you know. We don't know, right? So, okay, a couple, a couple last questions before I let you go. I've been sorry for keeping you for so long. You're such, you're such a gracious. Uh, uh, well, it's, a, it's a pleasure. You know, how often do we get to talk like this? Yeah, I know. And there's other people watching us, which I'm not forgetting. I said to people, hey, forward some questions for Justin. And like 90% of the questions is, so when is Kevin and Justin going to do a project together? Which is cra- Kevin Martin. <laughs> is he, yeah. what's the so hit, me, hit me up. You got my email. Yeah. Uh, oh no, me and you exactly. Well, we we're, we we yeah. we're starting it in about six about about six weeks. All we got to do is all I've got to do is build four primitive tracks. You build four. I'll send four to you. You send four to me. I'll layer on top. You layer on top. We have got an album. That sounds like a great idea. Let's do it. Yeah. Okay. As soon as you want. You're the master of of coming up with band names. <laughs> That's a good point. That is, yeah. I'll, I'll think on that one. Oh, yeah, so many, so many cool pandas. Uh, uh, we haven't even touched on Pale Sketcher, Gray Machine, Zonal, uh, any of your fi- final stuff, and going so far, so far. Uh, another question: uh, Is there going to be a new? Sc- you're going to be um, working with Mick Harris on New Scorn? Yeah, he's invited me to play guitar on um, the New Scorn. Yeah, Brilliant. which is uh, I played on the first ever Scorn, and now. I mean, yeah. Mickey, I don't know if Mickey is going, Mickey's claiming this is going to be his last one, but I mean, Mick's a bit like me. Every album is his last. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to play, uh, guess, guess some guitar guitar on there. I think both both brutal guitar and more shoegazy stuff, I think, yeah. on top of his beats, on top of his beats and bass. So that'll be, that'll be interesting. Did Mick play drums for Godflesh at one point? We did... Um, Opening for Nirvana? No, he didn't play. That was Drum Machine. Yeah, yeah okay. that was that nice. was drum machine because uh, I think we may have upset Nirvana if we used the drummer because Nirvana loved Godflesh. Do you know what I mean? And Kurt, upset Dave Grohl—that's a that—that's an accomplishment. Dave Grohl fucking 
sat behind him and Chris sat behind my amp the whole time we played. And then Dave Grohl come chasing after me after to get our t-shirts. And we were just like Nirvana, yeah, you know, whatever. This because you know, it's just before they broke, wasn't it? For so sure. we were like, oh, who's you know the drummer guy from Nirvana's trying to get uh, one of our t-shirts for free? We were like, yeah, have one of them for free. <laughs> Treat yourself. Following week, they were like the biggest band in the world, you know, one of them. But uh, but they all loved us, you know. Kurt Kurt wanted us on himself, which was funny because when I met him, he didn't really uh, didn't really talk. <laughs> Whereas I'm a gobshite, you know. I was ready to like, oh, let's you know, but he was like, hey man, and that was it. <laughs> he was like, oh, okay. Another but yeah, yeah, but that was with the drum machine. Yeah, but Mick Harris played about four shows with us uh, as a four piece, actually, which was uh, which was uh, Robert Hampson from the band Loop, who right. played on half of Pure. He played as well. Now him nice. and Mick didn't get on either, so it was one of those. It was a real fucked up murder shit. But yeah, Mick played about he played about three or four shows with us, I think, and he didn't even use any in ear monitor. He used nothing. He just played along with the. Uh, we had, we had fun, but it lasted four four UK shows, and that was it. I think. Brilliant. Um, I met uh, Kirk Kirk Hammond in 1994, and I thought he was surprisingly cool and nice for a guy from Metallica. And he also said that he fucking loved you guys, Godflesh. Is it true that you, that you guys uh, did did uh, a song? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. I often some people say, "How do you forget about that?" But I often forget about it because. <laughs> We, we weren't in the, uh, we were in a, a removed state of mind, um, both of us. And we recorded a demo in this removed state of mind in, in, his, uh, in his old um, mansion in uh, Pacific Heights in, in, you know, Pacific Heights in Brilliant. San Francisco. Um, yeah, that was that, that was that following tour. After we toured with you guys, That's when really we came back, played yeah. with Dan's You Can Type a Negative, yeah. um, Kirk Hammett phoned up uh, our manager, you know, and said, I want to speak to Justin. I was like, I can't speak to Kirk Hammett. I can't, I can't talk to the guy. How can I talk to Kirk Hammett, you know? Um, but he, he, he turned out to be a fantastic, a yeah. lovely man. And he invited us to his house. And yeah, and oh, we did it. Like, hey, I want to hang out yeah. with you. It's like, yeah, oh, exactly. It was absolutely, uh, you know, it was fantastic. And um, we played, uh, I taught him how to play some Godflesh songs. I couldn't believe he couldn't, he, he, he literally, you know, guy's a fucking amazing guitarist, but I had to teach him how to play Godflesh songs. It was like, what but um i told him that and then i think the following day because we spent we were rehearsing in san francisco we went down and uh that night after doing a cocktail of all manner of illegal substances we decided at 3 a.m to go make a demo and i think we did three songs i still have that on i do have that on tape i might even hear that oh my god it's, it's, it's fucked up as well it's really fucked up due to uh substances but uh, it's one of them where, you know, it proves that you, you shouldn't, on, on copious amounts of all manner, you po- probably shouldn't do a demo with the guy from Metallica. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. I would love to hear it. Maybe one day, <laughs> if we're yeah, around yeah. Uh, backstage again, you can, just between you, us. You, you can sneak me an MP3 and listen. Just between us. Man, yeah. uh, there was uh, one more question here. Uh, what was it like to work with Pantera and what did they think about Godflesh? Oh god! Oh, that's the first remix I ever did. Really? You know? Yeah. And that was um, it was uh, it was uh, the track "Fucking Hostile" and "By Demons Be Driven." Two songs I did remix. Two songs, Pantera. I think that was '92. I think so. It was all around the time of early, you know, early. two of you guys and when, yeah. wow. you know, all of a sudden, God, everybody seemed to be somehow interested in Godflesh. You know, where I remember being like, "Whoa!" And then I was remixing Pantera, yeah. Which I think, really, in retrospect, it was only Phil who was the big, uh, the big Godflesh fan. But the other guys, when I met them, after I did the remixes, we went to see them in Wolverhampton in, in fucking outside Birmingham. Uh, and we met them just after I did the remixes. And they they all loved the remixes. You know, I was really, really fucking surprised that it wasn't just Phil Anselmo that loved it because he was a big Godflesh fan. It was all a Pantera. Pantera. And um, that gave me a remix career, to be honest. After that, I was remixing yeah. fucking people left, right. And so, you know what I mean? It was like, yeah. Gave me confidence as well, because that was my first real remix was fucking yeah. Pantera. Pantera were like huge at that time as well. Yeah, they were yeah. like, you know, the single I did the remix for was this Walk, that song Walk. And that was like in the top 40 in international charts in the UK and all this shit. So I was like, it was me and Jim Fetus who did the remixes, do you know what I mean? Well, I didn't know Jim Fetus was on yeah, there. Jim did it. Was what was really funny was I remember awesome. um, the drummer, Vinny, he's, he's gone now, isn't he? The drummer, uh, Vinny... Um, 
That's the drummer with Pantera, fucking yeah. classic guy. But he said to me how much he liked my remix, but he didn't like the other dance shit. I remember thinking to myself, oh, yeah, yeah. But I remember saying that. I was thinking, oh, that's, that's, that's a fucking legend. It's fucking fetus, you know what I mean? Absolutely. You know, and like, Boy's Blood, Dirt Dish is one of my favourite albums of all time. Oh, yeah, you know yeah, what yeah. I mean? I was like, Jim is fucking brilliant. I met Jim subsequently. You know, he's had... Yeah, he had Techno Animal on with, with him a number of times and stuff. And, you know, love. Well, we met him on uh, First God Flesh tour, but yeah, he's, you know, he's amazing. But uh, I remember being, oh my God. But Pantera loved it. I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow, okay. And that set me off on a, a, a remix career, you know, which I, I'm still remixing people now. I'm remixing somebody right at the moment. You know, I'm, I'm remixing all the time. So. Yeah, I heard a killer Control Bleeding remix you just did uh, recently. Oh shit, you heard that? Yeah, we had Paul on here recently. Uh, Again, oh, did you? yeah, raving about you. Yeah, everyone loves you, brother. It's like, it's like there's everybody who uh, loves you. The, the the subject comes up, and it's like, oh yeah. Oh, Paul's amazing though. Any control, early control bleed, control bleeding generally, obviously. Yeah. But uh, as an album, I always, I always uh, just piss Paul off by talking about the same record all the time. It, but he knows <laughs> like, I love control bleeding generally. And I first heard them on a broken flag compilation when they were extreme electronics. So I love them then. But this album called Head Crack. Me I too. That's what yeah, I, we, I just had him on. I just want to talk about head crap the whole time. Yeah, yeah you did as well. I, but, but surely we must have bonded over that record maybe it's back possible. in the tour. It's, it's possible, yeah, for sure. It's one of my favorite albums of all time. Oh, man. It? You know, I, had to, I have to pat people on the back for making seminal albums. And, oh, you know, shit. Um, yeah. I don't know how many I can pat you on the back for. There's like more than, more than a few, that's for sure. Really? In many different genres. Yeah, man. Oh, we got to swing round just very briefly. Touch back on like what you said that with Napalm Death, loving Skinny Poppy, is actually it was Mick Harris when he was in Napalm Death. He played me Too Dark Park. I'd only heard earlier Skinny Poppy. I but Too Dark Park for me was fucking pivotal. He played it to me, and I, I was on acid. We were both on acid. Me and Mick Harris, big trip. And it was it was like in typical Mick, like just you got to fucking hear this album. This is the fucking trip record, just right in my face, like. Put it on full volume in his flat. I wow. remember being like, "Holy fucking shit, this is trip music!" And that was it. That was it. I played it. To, uh, I think I don't think Ben was at that trip, but um, that was it. Then I just went out and just bought everything by Skinny Puppy. You know what I mean? It was uh, that was just before. That was before we toured. That was about no, yeah, probably maybe fuck. When in between ninety and ninety two for sure. Yeah, but that's it. Before it's maybe about ninety one because Arabi's. I then went out and bought Rabies, and uh, I fucking loved that album then as well. And it just it just built from there for me with the Skinny Poppy job, you know I man. Um, so by that time, I just become this like massive fan. And it was thanks to when Mick was in Napalm Death, but all of Napalm Death were fans of Skinny Poppy, all of them. I didn't know that. I mean, you didn't tell me about Mick Harris, but uh, you know, that's say hi to Mick for us. That's great. Thank you very much. Oh, he, he would love to hear something yeah. from you. He'd be like, "Fucking hell, I want to do something with Kevin." <laughs> yeah, he he uh, also knows uh, uh, Mark Spivey, who uh, was from Soviet France, who I've Absolutely. ended up working with uh, quite a with bit. Download? With Download. Yeah. Was, like, we played in Birmingham in 96, and I remember that you, that you were there, and I thought like, oh, fuck, I think you might hate this. <laughs> was I there? I think, you, I think you were briefly. I don't know if you could hang for the show. but Maybe um, it was one of them where I couldn't stay. I know yeah, Ben went I to see you. Yeah, you came in. I think I just saw you just before we said hi. And that was actually the last time I saw you. Actually, I saw you in London in 96 when you were opening for Frontline Assembly. We did. The, yeah, that's right. We said that as well. Yeah. But we, I mean, we've kept in, we have fragmented contact, don't we? But yeah. in, in, in the physical realm, we haven't seen each other physically in fucking it's years. Been, yeah, yeah, yeah. Been, um, absolutely brilliant. Uh, thank you so much for uh, spending. Amazing. I'm with me today, Justin. I've had, a, I've had, a, I've had a blast. Um, will you keep us posted as to uh, what's coming up? And um, absolutely. I mean, we're we 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 we're, we're in contact, but it is fragmented, isn't it? Yeah. But we we need to, uh, like we just said, we need to get this uh, collaboration album on the roll. You see, folks, that's what happens when you ask questions. This is it. This is it. It's, it's way overdue. We should have done it like 20 years ago. Yeah, um, yeah. No better time. Well, again, my friend, let's thank you so much for joining me today on Sunday Live Chat. Uh, everyone, let's have a big thanks for Justin K. Broderick. Sir, all the best to you.
Let me just tell people that if, in case everybody's like, what, what's the fuck are doing in a hood? Is the boiler in my house has broken down. So I've got no <laughs> heat in my studio. All my heaters from my studio have had to go over to the house. I am genuinely freezing fucking cold. So um, that's why I'm wearing a hood. I'm fucking freezing. I should be wearing glasses like you there, Kevin, but I'm uh, I'm too vain. I thought glasses, I'm not going with the glasses. So it's gotten too bad for me, I'm telling you. Oh, it's, it is for me. It's fucking terrible. I know, it's how my eyesight's fucking awful. But uh, yeah. But Kevin, absolute pleasure. Absolute thank pleasure you. myself too. Thank you for having a, a British gutter snipe like myself on your show. <laughs> best to you and uh, your son and family. And uh, let's, 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 re, let's re-chat again soon. Absolutely. And we'll get this album rocking. So, okay. it's, it's, so it's out for next year. Hi to Ben and hi to all, all your mates. Yeah. Let's, Love uh, to all the crew. Love to all the crew. Right on. All right. Talk to you soon, Justin.